This is CBC News. At 12 o'clock, we're at plus one with sunny skies over downtown Winnipeg. Good afternoon. I'm Matt Humphrey. The Winnipeg Construction Association isn't happy with the government's decision to restore a one-to-one ratio for apprenticeships. Previous standards allowed a journey person to supervise up to two apprentices. The NDP called the ratio unsafe and countered the need to attract more skilled workers. Ron Hambly is president of the Construction Association. He says of the 62 trades which rely on apprenticeships in Manitoba, 37 are construction related. Our industry and many other industries are struggling with workforce and our ability to grow is based on our ability to grow the workforce. Um, and at a, at a one-to-one ratio we grow very very slowly. At a two-to-one ratio we can grow the industry Uh, a a little quicker. Meanwhile, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and Manitoba Building Trades like the change, saying a one-to-one ratio is safe and fiscally responsible. A 27-year-old man is wanted by police in connection to the death of Edgar Allan Bear in Winnipeg last week. On March 18th, police found the 56-year-old Bear dead in a home along Selkirk Avenue. Investigators say he was a member of Pegwis First Nation, but was living in Winnipeg. Police now say Maxim Dale Garneau is facing a charge of second-degree murder and is considered dangerous. And you can see Garneau's photo at cbc.ca slash Manitoba. There's some surprising news this morning from the Canadian economy. Statistics Canada says the country's gross domestic product was up by 0.6% in January. It's modest growth, but as we hear now from Peter Armstrong, it's better than most analysts were expecting. I think you can safely call this a rebound. The headline number is better than expected. The flash estimate for February, better than expected. Manufacturing led the charge here, which is good because we saw a pretty sharp decline in manufacturing back in December. So all this feeds into that narrative that the economy is poised to pose something of a rebound through 2024. And these data might tell us that it's coming faster even than we might have expected. But it's evident that some of this isn't just the kind of economic grind of people buying more stuff. A big chunk of the rebound in manufacturing, for example, comes as production resumed at auto assembly plants after they had shut down for some retooling. So it's a good report. But like everything else these days, it includes some important caveats and points to a still choppy road back to that recovery. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Overseas, Russia is reportedly using a new weapon in its war on Ukraine. That's the head of Kharkiv's regional police describing a flying bomb that was used on the city earlier this week. It appears to be a cross between a cruise missile and a drone, and crucially, it's cheap to produce. In this week's strike, one person was killed and at least 19 were injured. The association representing radiation technologists says more staff is needed to combat long MRI wait times at some Winnipeg hospitals. We're hearing of burnout among technologists, putting in extra shifts. Dana McTaggart with the Technologist Association says workers are feeling the strain. We feel a sense of responsibility for it. Like we don't want patients to wait longer than they have to. We're contributing to to the burnout of ourselves by wanting the best for our patients and by continuing to take overtime shifts in order to fill, you know, night shifts that are voluntary to get patients the scan they need quicker. McTaggart hopes the forthcoming provincial budget will have more money for techs, education and retention. We're expecting that budget next Tuesday. Four Ontario school boards are taking some of the largest social media companies to court. The multi-billion dollar lawsuit alleges their products have rewired the way children think and behave and have disrupted the learning process. Megan Fitzpatrick has your details. School boards in Toronto, Peel Region and Ottawa say social media is causing so much harm to students, the courts need to step in. Their lawsuits are seeking more than $4 billion in compensation from the companies that own Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and Snapchat. The court action alleges the platforms are designed to be addictive, deliberately target young people, and they're causing major harm to their mental health and their ability to learn. 
Lawyer Duncan Embury is representing the boards and says the goal is not just financial, they're seeking meaningful change. Change to the nature of the algorithmic designs underlying these products, change to the age restrictions associated with them, change the parental controls. CBC has reached out to the companies for comment. So far, Snapchat is responding by saying it feels good about the role it plays in helping people feel connected and that it's different than other social media companies. Megan Fitzpatrick, CBC News, Toronto. And the man responsible for one of the largest financial frauds in U.S. history has been sentenced to 25 years in prison. Sam Bankman Freed, former CEO of FTX, a cryptocurrency exchange. When it collapsed two years ago, it cost investors billions. Bankman Freed was convicted in November on multiple counts of fraud, conspiracy and money laundering. He is sentenced to 25 years. In Winnipeg, sunshine today, a high of plus one, Brandon, a high of minus two, and mainly sunny. Right now, you are listening to CBC Radio 1, 990 AM, 89.3 FM. Good afternoon and welcome to Radio Noon. I'm Laurie Hoogstratton. It's looking like it's going to be spring outside. Highs of one degree today. And coming up on the show, what does your Manitoba health card look like? Tattered? Torn? Maybe a little stained? All that's about to change. The Premier of Manitoba, Wab Canoe, will join us at 1245 to talk about the move to plasticized and digitized health cards. And the Easter egg hunt has gone high tech. Kids will be using GPS to locate Luff at Oak Hammock this weekend, unless the Easter Bunny scrambles the signal. That's at 1235. And the global cocoa bean shortage is leaving one chocolatier with a bitter taste in her mouth. We'll hear how it's impacting her business. But first, inside a machine that has big economic and cultural significance in Manitoba's interlake, the Bombardier and Born Aboard a Bombardier. Now, that's a claim to fame. We're going to hear that story right now after uh, after we lead in with the bombardier from the now 75-year-old former baby. Maybe you were listening this morning on Information Radio. Uh, guest host Emily Brass and CBC's Corey Funk talked about Emily's adventure aboard a vintage bombardier on Lake Manitoba near St. Laurent. Bombardiers are a dying breed, but they're still prized in the commercial fishing industry in Manitoba. Take a listen. They kind of look like part snowmobile, part magic bus. You know, picture a big vehicle. <laughs> it's got rounded corners and circular sure porthole style cute. windows, oh, you know, wow. kind of like the ones you might see on a boat or a submarine. Uh-huh. Yep. And on the bottom are two big tracks in the back, like on a snowmobile or heavy equipment. And in the front, the bombardier sits on two skis that look a bit like snowboards. And the specialized construction means anywhere in the snow and ice. That makes them love at least the country and stuff. You come to St. Laurent, you're going to see some bombardiers. It's a given. <laughs> I should also mention that bombardiers are, are pretty spacious inside you. They can hold a lot of people or fish. And, you know, they also have a wood stove on board to keep you nice and toasty, which is really important when you're spending your days out on the ice fishing. Oh, it's so cool. And I heard there, Mo touched on St. Laurent being a, a Métis community. So, so what's the connection actually there between that cultural identity and and bombardiers. Yeah, it's so interesting. I had a chance to speak with a mémère, which means grandmother in Michif French, and I asked her, as an elder, what was it like growing up Métis in Saint Laurent? And the first thing she said is, we had a bombardier in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, people there used to go out ice fishing with a horse and carriage, and when bombardiers came along, it, it revolutionized the industry in Saint Laurent. And it became so iconic that the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., invited that little community to put a bombardier on display as part of a big First Nations exhibit. Yeah. And it stayed in that museum for 10 years. When it was finally time to bring the bombardier back to St. Laurent, it was Mo who was sent down to get it. So I drove with my pickup truck and a trailer and brought it all the way back. Well, I can tell you that when I was way south, we turned a lot of heads on the highway. (laughs) And I actually had people follow me in gas stations and say, what is that thing? 
Like, what do you do with that? You know, because they've never seen snow or anything. So it was, it was pretty amazing. What did you say? Like, you I know, had what? to start and tell them, explain that there's our lakes actually freeze here. You know, so I had to explain that first. And uh, and I said we have that white stuff that they call snow, and then these things travel on there. And people, you know, and it was it was, it was a lot of fun actually to to get to explain to people what they do. <laughs> Explaining winter to Americans, though, that's, that's <laughs> tough. Uh, so, so they're used in St. Laurent for ice fishing, but what was the original purpose of, of the bombardier itself? Well, the first bombardier was designed in Quebec by Joseph Armand Bombardier in 1937, and he got the idea after his child died during a blizzard. The family couldn't reach the hospital because in those days there was no public snow clearing of roads. So Bombardier called them snow coaches and they were initially used as school buses and ambulances and for delivering mail and supplies during the winter. Mass production started in the 1940s when the coaches were used for wartime needs. But by the end of that decade, municipal snow clearing became the norm and sales dropped dramatically. Attention shifted to Bombardier's newer invention, the Skidoo, and the company stopped making the iconic snow coaches in the late 70s. Okay, so doing some quick math in my head, and that means that <laughs> uh, the last ones were made ab- about 50 years ago. So how do, how do they run? Because, I mean, that's that's quite a long time since they, they've been out of, out of service. Yeah, well, surprisingly well, but most of the bombardiers out there today aren't running on all the original parts or engine. And I got to meet a commercial ice fisher named Mike Chartran, who took us out on that epic tour in his bombardier. So, you know, we went out on the frozen Lake Manitoba, We helped him drill some holes in the ice and pull in the nets and bring in a little catch of fish. And riding in it was like riding in a tank almost. You know, you felt invisible. We went over marshland and snow banks and out onto the ice. It was like we could go anywhere. And Mike told me he spends a lot of time fixing up his bombardier to keep it running so well and says, you know, that's what it takes to keep it running smoothly. If it's maintained properly, the right, if it's in the right person's hands and it's maintained properly and you get the parts, she run forever. Might not look at to you, but uh, the old undercarriage, the motor, the tranny has all, all been changed brand new. All the bearings underneath, the brass bearings, everything underneath my tracks are new. Everything is maintained properly. If you're a handy person and you can do a lot of work yourself, good. But if you've got to pay somebody to put it all together and get the parts, the parts are expensive. And, you know, when he said it might not look it to you, <laughs> just picture his bombardier is like light blue with chip paint and rust in lots of spots and the doors don't match. He's got brand new like metal doors that he bought the he bought the metal and got his buddy to do. <laughs> anyway, he also put in a new Chevy V8 engine wow. and he, he says he gets all of his parts new and they're often custom made. And, uh, you know, it, it does take a lot of work for him. Yeah, and I mean, it also sounds like he said it's a lot of money. It's pretty expensive. So do you think it's actually all worth the effort? Well, people in St. Laurent say there's nothing like a bombardier for ice fishing. They say a pickup truck gets stuck, you know, as soon as you get into the deep snow. And a snowmobile won't keep you warm and it can't haul back hundreds of kilos of fish. But there's also that cultural connection we touched on earlier. You know, Mike says some of his brothers and he, they're doing things the way their father did and their grandfathers before that. And that's going fishing with a bombardier. I've been around this since I was a kid. My dad had one when I was a kid already, and I was always hanging around and was just learning as I go, right? It's a Métis fishing community, so a common subject is bombardier around here, right? There's coffee shop talk in the morning. The guys meet up in, in the morning there all the time, too, and that's where you'd sometimes chat about finding the parts and all that, or if the mechanic in town has time for you to fit you in if you got a broken piece or something. So you just try to help the other guy out. You might even remember that from the other week, Corey, when the show was live at the mm-hmm. MTT gas station in St. Laurent. And some of those guys who were there having breakfast in the diner were talking about the lake and the fishing quota, which actually was reached really early this year, as well as the work they're doing on their bombardiers. Great story, Emily, from Emily. And right after Emily's story about the mighty bombardier, this call came in on the Lister line. Hello, just watching your story about bombardiers and... Uh, my girlfriend near Verdon was born in a bombardier in late February in 1949. Bye. Well, 
couldn't resist. So Corey Funk, who is directing uh, the morning show this morning, gave Linda a call, and Linda gave her friend a call. And once we got the go-ahead, I phoned Joyce Leslie of Verdon to get her I Was Born in a Bombardier story. Here's our conversation. So, Joyce, how did you come to be born in a bombardier? I mean, give us the whole lead-up. Set the scene. Where was this? Well, we lived east of Verdon, um, about 10 miles. And so I guess the roads are, weren't good. I mean, not 75 years ago. Or there, I think there might have been a storm, too, so which added to it. And... Um, so they, I guess they called the bombardier to get, get, come and get my mom, um, because in those days it would be probably horse and buggy type thing. So they called. Well, there was quite a delay before they got there because they had been out in the, in our area to pick up a deceased man. And then by the time they got back into Verdon and got the call, then they had to come back out to our farm and so I guess by that time, <laughs> it was getting too late. And I guess my mother had said she would have been gladly rode with this deceased man <laughs> if they had no one. <laughs> they could have picked her up on the way. <laughs> he wouldn't have minded. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have known one, really, no. But they, it, it was her fourth child. Uh, like, she had five children. I was the fourth one. So maybe we... I came fair, you know, fairly soon, you know, faster than say a first baby or something too. I don't know. So who who went in the bombardier? Okay, my um, it would be my dad's mom went in the bombardier with her, and she had a fur coat on. So then when I was born, they took she took her fur coat off, and I guess they wrapped me in that. And who delivered you? I guess the grandmother, <laughs> or maybe I just popped up. <laughs> And has this been a bit of a cautionary tale over the years? Have you told this story often? Oh, yeah. The kids laugh at me all the time. <laughs> well, it's a wonderful story, Joyce, and thank you so much for sharing it with us. Oh, okay. Yeah, bye. Bye. Joyce Leslie was a bombardier baby 75 years ago. She lives in Verdon. And if you were born under startling circumstances, share. Give us a call, 204-788-3205. Hi, I'm Leah. And I'm Phelan. We're the hosts of the Irreverent History Podcast, The Secret Life of Canada. We've covered everything from the history behind the iconic Bay Blanket to why blackface is still a thing and how all our histories can be traced back to our relationship with water. Oh, you forgot about the controversial debate over which dessert is the most Canadian, the butter tart or the Nanaimo bar? Yes, I did forget that. That was intense. The Secret Life of Canada. Available now on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Radio Noon on CBC Radio 1, 89.3 FM, 990 AM. I'm Laurie Hoogstratton. Taking a look at Riley's forecast today. Let's see. Highs of 1 degrees. Still a little breezy. Winds out of the northwest at 15. And on Friday, 2 degrees. And less breezy. Northwest at 10. Uh, and then it's going to snow on Friday, though, it looks like. And the same through Friday night and maybe cloudy on Saturday. But the temperatures are rocketing up there. Uh, threes on Saturday and Sunday. Six on Monday, Tuesday, seven and nine by Thursday. Well, except for the snow, that all sounds very good. Some temperatures for you. In Brandon, it's minus seven. Churchill, minus 12. In Dauphin, it's minus eight. Gimli, minus six. The Paw, minus 11. Thursday, Thursday. Thompson, minus 8. In Winnipeg right now, pointing minus 6 with the wind still brisk north-northwest at 20. Well, coming right up in the show, the Easter egg hunt. It's a tradition that goes way, way back, but using GPS to find the eggs is a little more modern. That's coming up at 1235. And what does your Manitoba health card look like? Raggedy? Torn? Stained? It's about to change. The Premier of Manitoba will join us at 1245 to talk about the move to plasticized and digitized health cards. Coming up right now, chocolate lovers will soon have to dig deeper in their pockets if they want a sweet treat. It's 20 minutes after 12 o'clock. 
There's a global cocoa bean shortage, so the Easter Bunny's operating budget is probably a lot higher. Extreme weather in West Africa has led to the shortage, and that's caused the cost of chocolate to climb. A year ago, cocoa was priced at about $27,000 U.S. per ton, and today the price per ton is just under $9,500 U.S. That's according to the International Cocoa Organization. Helen Staines owns Decadence Chocolates here in Winnipeg. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, Helen, how is the high rising cost of cocoa beans impacting your business? It hasn't impacted me yet. But it will. Um, my supplier is under contract uh, until May. So uh, our price is stable until then. Um, but I've been watching the price go up for weeks now and worrying about it. And uh, I still don't know what it's going to go up to yet. I'm waiting. And how much more expensive do you expect chocolate to get in the coming months? I don't even want to think about that right now. Yeah. And did you have... <laughs> Okay. It's pretty scary. Yeah. And yeah, did you know this was coming? Um, we've been following it for a few weeks now. Um, so I have known it's been on the rise. This, you know, uh, So this hasn't just surprised me today kind of thing. So I have been talking to my supplier. And, uh, yeah, we're just sort of waiting to see what their price is going to be when, when they renew the contract. Yeah, because it seems to have pretty much tripled is that right tripled yeah absolutely oh boy. absolutely oh boy yeah so um, the chocolate i use i import from france so it's an expensive product to start with mm-hmm. um so yeah it, it's worrying so what kinds of adjustments uh, will you have to make to adapt to the higher prices once they uh, kick in um i'm try well we'll have to be more efficient in what we do uh, we're not like the big businesses i i can't do shrinkflation and you know, change the size of my chocolate bars because I've already bought all the chocolate molds. So for me to change the size of my chocolate bar, I have to go and out and rebuy chocolate molds, yeah. which is another expense. Um, so we're just going to have to be, you know, uh, very careful in what we do. Um, there will have to be some kind of price increase. There's no way I can avoid that, but just be very efficient. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to diversify. I just bought a freeze dryer um, late last year. So we're trying to do some freeze-dried items as well just to uh, expand our range and, uh, you know, keep things interesting and fresh. Well, and you mentioned your chocolate comes from France. Mm-hmm. So there, there's quite a quite a range in chocolate quality, I suppose. And there is, the absolutely. One and yours is? Ours is a, a very high-quality chocolate, and I'm not willing to... Um, to sacrifice that. Yeah. But this comes also as inflation is causing a lot of people to tighten their discretionary spending. So, Mm -hmm. and yours is already, I guess, as you say, pretty high end in quality and and price. So have you been noticing much in terms of customer behavior lately? Um, Yeah, we're definitely noticing, uh, you know, it is up and down uh, with custom trade coming in. Um, So we do notice it with people. Uh, they are tightening their belts. I do have a, a very loyal following who um, support me, which is wonderful. But, um, you know, we're always looking for new customers to come and try our product. And once they try it, they you can taste the difference. There's, mm-hmm. there's no getting around that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I also wonder, too, in, in tough times, people do want to treat themselves a little sometimes. And something like a delicious bit of chocolate might be just worth spending the money on. That, that's what I think. <laughs> it's always worth spending the money on, yeah. So, so, there's so, definitely a difference between good and bad chocolate. Yeah. So so tell me, how busy is this time of year for you, and how important is this particular season for sustaining your business? Um, Easter is is our second busiest season uh, right after Christmas. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a busy one for us. It's one we've been preparing for since Christmas, basically. Yeah. Um, so we've been getting ready since then and, uh, yeah, it's important for, uh, for the quieter months that are coming up, you know, summer is a hot month, summer is hot and, uh, chocolate doesn't travel well in the heat. So, uh, we have to make sure we've got enough going on to keep us going through the summer. Yeah. And so what are some of your special Easter treats that you have on offer right now? Uh, well, we have our artisan Easter eggs that are all hand painted. Uh, so they're beautiful in design. Um, and then um, we have lots of different bunnies. Um, we have 
uh, paint your own eggs. <laughs> so we've made some sort of hen-sized Easter eggs um, that come with pots of paint, edible paint. Uh, the kids can paint, or the adults can paint the eggs, and then you get to eat them afterwards. And what kind of things do you hide inside your Easter eggs? Um, well, they're all they're not yeah they're all filled to be honest. So some have uh, sponge toffee. Uh, they have freeze-dried chocolate ice cream. That's that's a vegan one that we do. Hmm. Um, some have candies and gummies and jelly beans and freeze-dried Skittles in them. Uh, some are filled with caramels and pralines um, and different things like that. Well, that certainly got us in the Easter frame of mind. Sounds absolutely delicious, and I wish you good luck with your sales this Easter. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Helen. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Helen Staines is the owner of Decadence Chocolate here in Winnipeg. I'm Angeline Tedaweo, host of The Block. Step into a two-hour experience that feels like you're laid back, kicking it with a friend who also happens to be a music head, always keeping it interesting. Listening to new songs you love and classics that transport you right back to your life's biggest moments. The Block, weeknight starting at 7, 7.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Music and anytime on CBC Listen. Just coming up to 27 minutes after 12 o'clock, you're listening to Radio Noon. And now from Cat Clyde, this is Mystic Light. That was Cat Clyde with Mystic Light. You're listening to Radio Noon, and coming up in the second half of the show, the Easter egg Easter egg hunt has gone high tech. Kids will be using GPS to locate Luff at Oak Hammock this weekend, unless the Easter Bunny scrambles the signal. And the Premier of Manitoba will join us just before one o'clock. And we'll ask everybody, what does your health card look like? All tattered and torn. Well, that's about to change. And exactly how that's all going to work, we'll find out. 
The news is next. This is CBC News. At 12.30, we're at minus 4 degrees with sunny skies over downtown Winnipeg. Good afternoon, I'm Matt Humphrey. The NDP's move to change apprenticeship journeyman ratios is drawing mixed reaction. Previous standards allowed a journey person to supervise up to two apprentices. The New Democrats called the ratio unsafe and changed it back to one to one. Ron Hambly is president of the Winnipeg Construction Association. He says already only about 50 percent of the people who sign up to be a journey person finish. We don't see it as being helpful to the industry. Um, there's going to be apprentices that are at, at, at one of the levels that are going to be laid off. I think that's, that's a foregone conclusion. There will be people that, you know, without the supervision levels, uh, will, will leave the industry, which is something we don't want to see. Meanwhile, the move is being applauded by the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and Manitoba Building Trades, who say their members will be safer. Winnipeg police are looking for a man wanted in connection to a homicide earlier this month. Police say 27-year-old Maxim Dale Garneau is wanted for second-degree murder in the March 18th death of Edgar Allan Bear inside a home. It happened on Selkirk Avenue. Bear was a member of Pegwis First Nation who lived in Winnipeg. And you can see Garneau's photo on our website, cbc.ca slash Manitoba. And the Supreme Court of Canada has ruled a First Nation in Yukon can continue to require elected councillors to live on traditional territory. A band member had challenged that requirement, saying it infringed on her rights. Julian Gignac has more. The majority of justices say no side won. So what we're looking at could be characterized as, you know, somewhat of a stalemate. Von Tudgwichen First Nation has argued that the charter doesn't apply to it because it has a self-government agreement in place. The Supreme Court says, well, not quite. The charter does apply to the First Nation. The Supreme Court considers the residency requirement an exercise of, quote, treaty rights, or other rights, and that the Vontad Gwich'in is protected by what the court is calling indigenous difference. What does this mean for Dixon? The court found her equality rights, also covered under the charter, were breached by the residency requirement. So we had the First Nations and Dixon's rights in conflict here, and still the court ruled the First Nation is insulated from Dixon's claim because of those indigenous collective rights which prevail. And CBC reporter Julian Gignac speaking from Whitehorse. And that is your CBC News from Winnipeg. Again, for news anytime, head on over to our website, cbc.ca slash Manitoba, or use the CBC News app. Why not? Why not? It's Why right not? there. It's right there. Got a question for you, Matt. Lay it on me. Well, we're having uh, Wab Canoe, our premier, is coming in uh, in a little while. It's all about health cards being plasticized. Of course. And possibly digitized, all, all those things. What what kind of shape is your health card in right now if you pulled it out of your wallet? If indeed you even have one. <laughs> no, I got one. Um, I'm lucky, though, because I only got one. Uh, a year or two. Yeah, ago, right? a year. Uh, so it's not right? too raggedy? A year and a half. No, it's, it's hanging in there. But yeah, oh, it's already... Yeah creased. Okay, we're taking a little little poll here. I'm, I'm going to move over to Riley now and ask him about his. We've got you, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, back soon. Okay. Mine's a little bit worse for wear. Yeah. I've had mine for a while. Yeah. <laughs> mine, uh, I was yeah, saying too. earlier that uh, I, I, I'm sure that my mother probably still has uh, our names on it. Yep. Um, and it's probably a little worse for wear as well. <laughs> It's probably quite old. I, I can attest to that. Um, my daughter's in her 30s, and it's still, oh, there's little Mary Thea on my card. But if you, my card is in two pieces. Oh, yeah, of, mine's in two card. pieces, too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so this will be good news all round, you know, when, and we'll, we'll hear the details from Premier Wab Canoe coming up. But first, the weather. Okay, let's uh, have a look at your forecast now, because uh, we are looking at a little bit of snow moving into the province as we get into the next couple of days. So uh, right now, minus four in Winnipeg. That's our current temperature temperature. Northwest wind at 28, uh, pressure 102.0 at the moment. Across southern Manitoba, temperatures uh, at about minus 2 to minus 4 degrees, uh, even a couple of zeros on the map right now. Melita and uh, Morden Winkler both at zero. Minus 5 in Thompson and uh, Churchill at minus 12 degrees. Mainly sunny right now across uh, the province. A little bit of cloud uh, along the Hudson Bay coast still where we're seeing a little bit of light snow still falling from that Colorado low earlier in the week. 
that moves out in time for an Alberta clipper to move into the province. So uh, as we move through the rest of the afternoon, we're looking at winds lightening up, mainly sunny skies across the province. So uh, all in all, I'm going to classify today as pleasant in terms of (laughs) sky condition and temperature. But as we get into Friday, uh, even by about the six o'clock hour tomorrow morning, we see clouds starting to build into the western part of the province and some light snow beginning. By the time we hit the noon hour, uh, this has spread into the West Men region along the international border as far east as Emerson, uh, Treehearn, Glenboro, uh, Wawanisa, down into Killarney Pilot Mound region, getting some of that light snow. Begins in the Winnipeg region around supper time, but by about midnight, early morning Saturday, it's fully moved out of the province, and we're back to uh, mainly cloudy sky with some periods of snow through the morning hours Saturday for southern Manitoba. Uh, and uh, sunnier conditions as we move into Easter on Sunday. So forecast snowfall, three to five centimeters. Generally could see some pockets up to 10 around the Riding and Duck Mountains through until early Saturday morning. Same for extreme southeastern Manitoba Sprague into northwestern Ontario could see uh, some higher accumulations uh, in that region. So your forecast today, uh, plus one is what I have for Winnipeg, uh, Gimli and uh, Victoria Beach, uh, Pinawa region at uh, minus one, mainly sunny skies today. Brandon, zero this afternoon, uh, Melita plus four, uh, Thompson mainly sunny and uh, minus one. For uh, Friday, Two degrees, uh, five to ten centimeters of snow across southern Manitoba. Saturday plus two, uh, mainly sunny Sunday uh, for Easter plus three. And then I have a six and a seven, Lori, for both Monday and Tuesday and mainly sunny skies. Very nice. And I was thinking on Sunday, if there has been a little bit of snow, yep. it'll be sort of nice to see the Easter bunny footprints yes, when you go out to very, very look, true. look for those eggs. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully they're colored eggs. Yeah. Let's hope so. Yes. They'll stand out. I'll be talking, <laughs> talking about an Easter egg hunt and I'm going to pose that snow hmm. question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much, no Riley. Problem. Have a great weekend. You too. That's Riley Latech, weather specialist, and you can hear him this afternoon on Up to Speed and, of course, see him on TV as well on CBC News at 6. It's 22 minutes before 1 o'clock. Well, it's a tradition that goes back centuries, hunting for Easter eggs. But that's no reason not to bring it up to date, like using GPS to help find the eggs. The Easter egg, the Easter bunny has yet to comment on the practice, so modern. But a GPS egg hunt is happening this weekend at Oak Hammock Marsh. And to learn how global positioning can lead to sweet treats, we've reached Jacques Bourgeois at Oak Hammock Marsh. Hi, Jacques. Hi, Laurie. So tell me, what do you think the Easter Bunny would say about using these high-tech methods to hunt for eggs? Well, I think you'd be all in favor of it. You think so? I think it's a good way to uh, to combine uh, high-tech technology and, uh, and that, an old-fashioned tradition, as you mentioned. So yeah. I think it, it, you'd be quite happy with that. It's really good fun, I think, yeah. So how, how does it all work? Well, basically, instead of uh, looking for eggs randomly in the grass or in the trails, we give... Uh, participants a tool or a GPS unit so they can all the coordinates are already plunked into the GPS and all they have to do is basically follow the different uh, waypoints to find a clue. So the clue are in the shape of eggs and each have letters on them. So once you get to the first clue, you record that letter on a piece of paper and so on about 10 to 12 times. And then once you found all the eggs scattered around the marsh, you come back to the uh, main building at the Willow Retreat, which is where it'll be taking place this year because the center is closed, as you probably know, because of uh, construction. And then we, they have to reassemble all the letters to find a word. And if they find the right word, they will get some sweet treats. Aha, that sounds good. So it's happening in the marsh? It's happening on, the, on our trails at the marsh. And uh, that's going to be on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And typically, it's been really, really popular. It's been selling out. I, I noticed there's a few spots still available. But uh, people can actually, uh, we, we, we usually are limited to two families per 15-minute slot because we don't want the kids to be able to see where the other kids have been before. So right. it gives them a head start. Uh-huh. And they have they go two different ways. One go in one direction, one family goes the other direction. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Kids just love it. They get all excited about finding those eggs. And, of course, once they get the, uh, the sweet treats at the end, they're super happy about that. And are there helpers along the way or anything like that if people kind of head off in the wrong direction or, or don't know how to use the stuff? Absolutely. We'll, we'll first train the participants on how to use a GPS. We'll do the first one with them to make sure they know how to use it. And then they'll be on their own. And it should take maybe about half an hour to 45 minutes, maybe an hour if they are 
a little slow, but usually uh, it should be uh, pretty quick to find. Yeah. And and what have you heard, as you say, you've done this before, What what's those common, uh, common kind of comments that you get? Oh, they love it. They love the fact that they get to use a GPS. Sometimes it's the first time they get to play with a GPS. And they like the, the fact that it, it, it combines, uh, like, like, like I said, technology with just walking in the marsh. And especially at this time of year, it's good to see all the birds returning. There's not that many yet. It's been a little cool lately. But there are, there are some geese and ducks that are making their way back to Manitoba. I was just saying to Riley Lechek, our, our weather specialist, that it, it, he, well, he was saying it could be a little snowy on Saturday. Will that make much of a difference? Well, that might give away some of the uh, locations, but I think it should be all right because people always uh, sort of uh, put extra tracks all ar- around the place so they can't really uh, figure out exactly where the eggs are. Right. So it should be, uh, should be still good. Yeah. And what else is going on over the weekend? Well, we also have our uh, bunny bingo. So <laughs> while you're waiting for your turn to go and GPS egg hunting, or if you want to do it afterwards, we have a, it's a, kind of like a game of uh, bingo, but we use the word bunny and people get treats and prizes as, as, as well. So it's kind of fun. Surprisingly fun, actually. <laughs> Bunny bingo. Even the name is fun, so that's good. <laughs> exactly. So Honestly, we've... I was a bit uh, skeptical when uh, when our uh, coordinator decided to have that game, Bunny Bingo. But yeah, yeah it's been really, really popular. <laughs> so I guess you... she, was, she was right. You never know. So that's before right. I let you go, uh, what's in store for spring at Oak Hammock this year? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are currently closed for major renovation and upgrades to the building. So the building itself is closed, but the trails are open. And we'll be trying to do a few events uh, throughout the, the season until we finally reopen, probably in the fall or maybe next spring. We'll see how construction goes. We're hoping for the fall, but we do have our uh, canoes that will be available as soon as the ice melts. We have some guided walks, birding uh, activities with our uh, resident naturalist, and so on. So we'll try to keep people uh, sort of engaged with activities at the marsh, even though we're closed right now. All right. Well, thanks very much for telling us about the egg hunt and the uh, bunny bingo. Thanks for having me. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. That's Jacques Bourgeois from Oak Hammock. And the fun runs from March 29th, 2024 to March 31st, 2024. You're listening to Radio Noon. It is 17 minutes before 1 o'clock. And Thursday is our word day, and this week's word can be shaken, stirred, swigged, swirled, salted, sweetened, or sipped through a straw. Here's Elizabeth Withy with the story of Cocktail. Cocktail parties have been around for nearly a century. Some of us like to host them, and others, like me, would rather just get invited. Yes, I like being a colada, getting caught in the rain. I'm not much into health food, I am into champagne. Next time you sip on your mint julep or a mojito, you can tell your friends why we call them cocktails. The most likely theory is this. Down in New Orleans, some 230 years ago, there was a pharmacist, and he had a hobby. Making fancy, boozy drinks for his fellow Masons inside his apothecary. Antoine Amédé Peychaud had come to New Orleans from modern-day Haiti, and apparently he was quite the mixologist. Peychaud is the guy behind Peychaud Bitters. And he made and served his tinctures in egg cups. Peychaud and his pals spoke French, of course. And in French, egg cup is coquetier, which in Old English was said cocktail. Coquetier, cocktail, cocktail. But here's another suggestion. Cocktail could come from the term for a horse with a docked tail, which would stick up and fan out like a rooster's comb. 
And because that tail style was used for regular horses of mixed pedigree, not purebreds, it might have inspired the name of a mixed beverage. Wasted away again in Margarita Bay. Searching for my lost shaker of salt. Personally, I love the notion of sipping a botanical brandy elixir from an egg cup. For CBC Radio, I'm Elizabeth Withy. It's nobody's fault. I don't know the reason. Stayed here all season. Nothing to show but this brand new tattoo. And if there's a word you're wondering about, drop a line to wordnerd at cbc.ca. You're listening to Radio Noon. It is 14 minutes before 1 o'clock. Well, the days of piecing together your health card for the receptionist at your doctor's office may soon be over. The province plans to roll out plastic health cards for Manitobans. Premier Wab Canoe is with us to tell us more about it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Laurie. Thanks for having me. Oh, good Good to have you here. I've been asking everybody what their health cards look like. I mean, mine's in like three pieces and uh, it's ready for an upgrade. How about yours? Yeah, it's, I was kind of uh, chuckling to myself when you were uh, sharing the introduction there because I'm looking at a cardboard health card that I just pulled out of my wallet. And it's all torn up across the top. You can't really see the Manitoba logo. You can barely see my health number. So yeah, I'd say we're due for an upgrade. So what and, will the... Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, and I was just going to say that's uh, that's the news that we're sharing today as part of the lead-up to the budget. Yeah, and what will the new health card look like? Well, I think the biggest thing is it's going to be plastic. So it'll be similar to what you see with your driver's license in terms of that uh, format on plastic. Details around uh, design, and you know, I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in what the actual look uh, of the card is going to be. That's going to be what we're going to be working on this year. Um, but I guess the announcement we're sharing today is one, we know that there's been like a huge backlog for health cards, people waiting months. So the first piece that we shared is that we've cleared that backlog and we've got a hotline, uh, stood up if you're wanting an update on where the status of your application is. So basically we're, we're cutting the, 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 the wait times to two weeks and saying, just like when you get a driver's license, the expectation should be you should get the uh, the permanent uh, piece of identification within a two-week timeline. And then I think the more um, interesting longer-term thing that we've done today is that we've committed that along with keeping the, uh, the weights for you to get your health card and your ID uh, short, we're going to bring in a, a plastic health card for Manitobans. So again, um, I think our press release said uh, we're now joining the 21st century, but uh, realistically, we're probably just uh, catching up with the 20th century <laughs> yeah. as it is. Well, I mean, that's going to be quite the task because I think we were looking it up and as of January 19th, <clears throat> excuse me, more than 9,000 people were still waiting for their paper health cards. Like, that's no, quite that's the right. backlog. Yeah, no, it, it was significant. And, you know, we've heard very difficult stories of people, you know, even just the uncertainty of trying to access care and, you know, you don't have the, the card in hand or you don't have your uh, health information number, et cetera. That's what we want to we, we wanna meet the needs of. Like, this is a pretty basic government service, making sure that you can get your health card and then you can access health care. So uh, behind the scenes, what we did is we, we doubled the amount of staffing uh, in the area. So there's about uh, two dozen people working in the area. And so that's uh, closer to 50 now. And uh, as a result... We've uh, been able to work through the backlog and we can say with confidence that, you know, going forward from today, if you if you apply for a health card, you'll get your permanent, uh, permanent version of that ID within two weeks. And then, of course, we're modernizing the system. We're bringing in uh, improvements to uh, electronic records. And as part of that, um, we're, we're going to roll out uh, a plastic ID well, why over not, the course of this year. Why not just go straight to digital? Well, I think there's a lot of folks who actually need a, a physical card. Uh, I think about, um, you know, even myself, not always, uh, 
being as uh, <laughs> tech friendly as uh, I once thought of myself. <laughs> I think having a physical ID is, is very good. We also know that there's, you know, parts of the province where connectivity, broadband is still an issue, but we want to have good quality health care there. And even, you know, just thinking about, you know, a, a paramedic who's out there in the field, uh, a firefighter, a first responder, and then being able to access your information on a plastic card as opposed to, to digital mm-hmm. uh, is, is, is like that's the baseline. What mm-hmm. I would say is we will also have a digital uh, alternative available. You know, you would be able to load this on an app in the future. But we think that the baseline of a, of a plastic card is still necessary to meet the needs of everybody in the province. And, of course, having a digital option on top of that is uh, going to make life a little bit easier, too. So you're saying the process will be no more arduous than applying for your driver's license? Yeah, no more time consuming is, is the, the real hope there. Uh, you know, you can get into an MPI office and uh, your ID shows up uh, in the mail in a couple of weeks, your driver's license is what I mean to say there. Mm-hmm. And so we feel that, you know, this being an important government service, a very basic government service, you should have the same expectation when you go into the health department office, apply for your health card, you should be able to get your your ID turned around in a, in about two weeks' time or less. Well, in BC, uh, they have their health cards tied to their driver's license. Is that uh, something you've considered? Uh, we've looked at it. I think for now, uh, we're happy to have uh, the driver's licenses uh, administered by MPI. And in, in order just to get these plastic health cards moving more quickly, having that continue to be administered by the, the health department is uh, is I think the quickest way forward here. Mm-hmm. And again, the other piece is there are some folks uh, who don't have driver's licenses. They're still going to need health cards, right? Yeah. And so just to make a separate standalone process where you can go in, you can get that health ID done uh, quickly in a reasonable amount of time. That's uh, what we're committed to. And when do you plan to have all these health cards handed out by? Um. So the new health card, we would hope that those are something that you can access easily by this time next year. So okay. that, you know, within the current fiscal year, we're doing the whole work of standing up the new database, designing the cards, and starting to roll them out the door. Yeah. So by the time we table our, our, our budget next year, that uh, people have access to these and they're, they're broadly uh, in circulation around the province. Well, and as you say, joining the 20th century, not to say the 21st century, <laughs> you know, it's a big operation. So what's this going to cost to get this done? Uh, well, we're going to share a bunch of the operational details in our uh, budget, which we're bringing forward uh, next Tuesday. But I would say that um, the horsepower to, for us to clear the backlog, which was the staffing piece and just doubling the amount of staff we're working on this, is something that we've been able to find within the existing budget of the Department of Health. So there's no like net new uh, cost with this. And then similarly, when we talk about new systems to enable that plastic health card that we're going to be rolling out later this year, uh, going into uh, the budget season for next uh, fiscal year, uh, that'll be part of the overall budget that we already have earmarked for the um, electronic paper records and modernizing other aspects of the healthcare system. And of course, Many patients, many nurses, physicians will be well aware that our healthcare system still uses fax machines and paper charts and pagers. And so this move to a plastic health card and some of the database work that goes on along with that is going to be a step towards other investments in modernizing the technology that we have in our healthcare system with a goal to making it better serve you, the patient who needs to access healthcare. Well, thanks very much for being with us today on Radio Noon. Can I share one quick thing? Just oh. uh, I got a, a hotline number here, a toll-free number. Oh, good, sure. If folks do want to inquire about, let's say you're, you've been waiting that uh, week or so since you applied for your health card or just want to follow <laughs> up on it, uh, it's 1-800-392-1207. Again, to get an update on the status of your health card application, 1-800-392-1207. Well, and goodbye to all those uh, crushed up, coffee-stained, tattered health cards in our wallets now. Very good to talk to you. Soon enough. Thanks so much, Laurie. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Wab Canoe is the Premier of Manitoba. Jarrett Martineau hosts Reclaimed. 
in an hour you could hear everything from powwow music to like a soft acoustic ballad to an electronic record to like a dub track all in the same hour from an indigenous artist from any part of the world eclecticism is an overused word obviously but i think the sheer diversity that gets represented on the show is something that's totally unique reclaimed with Jarrett martineau available now on cbc listen At five minutes before one o'clock, let's hear a little music off their 2017 album, The Wild. This is the Rural Alberta Advantage with All Right. You realize I said there's nothing left, not long ago. Night. You whispered back and cold Started racing out of touch Not long ago Last night sitting in the dark I was being difficult There's a weight in my heart That was atypical To never racing out of touch are we getting wide? Headlong into the night I was all alone I was contemplating letting you know But tonight we're speaking cold Head hard into the wild Contemplating loss and the consequence of getting old But for now we're speaking cold When the rain comes down on us I know you're gonna be I'm losing my touch And nothing being rectified So we're wasting our love While we're getting wise Headlong into the night I was all alone and I was contemplating Letting you know That was the Rural Alberta Advantage with All Right. In the fading moments of the show, I welcome guest host Chloe Friesen to the studio. Hi, Chloe. Hi, Lori. So this is Thursday. What's happening on the show? It's, it's Thursday, but it's also known to some people in the music industry as Bad Thursday. Bad Lori. Thursday. So we've got Good Friday, Easter Sunday, Easter Monday, but we're going to talk about Bad Thursday. So uh, right at the top of the show, we're going to hear about one of the busiest nights of music uh, a busy nights of the year for music venues. Something wow. I didn't realize, but yeah, Bad Thursday. Hmm, that sounds like there's a dark underbelly to this. <laughs> <laughs> How bad is it? Ah. Okay, well, uh, we'll be listening to find out why. Sounds good. Okay, thanks, Chloe. That's guest host Chloe Friesen. You can hear her this afternoon from 3 to 6 on Up to Speed. And just time to say goodbye and uh, watch out for the Easter Bunny. Look for his tracks. That's what I say, because there's going to be a little bit of snow. And I want to say thank you to Corey Funk, Matt Humphrey, Riley Laychuk, Brad Lillies, Daniel Friesen, Dylan Longhurst, and to you, dear listeners, and Wendy Parker, and Leif Larson. Yeah, so get out there, GPS or not. I wonder if you can drive around the backyard in your car using the GPS system to try and get the eggs like they're going to be doing because they're having that egg hunt at uh, Oak Hammock this weekend if you want to go out and do some high-tech egg hunting. Otherwise, you can do that thing where you boil the eggs, dye them in that stinky vinegary stuff, and color them, and then have to eat them all. <laughs> My grandmother used to make egg salad with those Easter eggs on Monday, and they would be so gray, sort of grayish-green. Yum! The chocolate Easter eggs are much better, but a little pricey. Have a lovely weekend. Talk to you next week. Bye.